It's actually working this time. Whoa, nope. Hey, it's working. Um, <laughs> the screen share had some interesting quirks. Um, it showed a screen share within a screen share within a screen share within a screen share right on out to infinity. Google Hangouts. So. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. Um, it's like you are here. Yeah, I, just, um, I don't know. Uh, I did the. I started the capture first, and then did the screen share. Or I was doing it the other way first. So, so that's it right there. Okay. So I did want to just real quickly introduce and go over the final projects. Final projects again. I um, were launched in in lecture module twelve uh, last week. Um, you're to choose one final project. That's all that's required. Um, I'll talk about the ethics discussion board here in just a minute as well. Um, again, LAMP and WordPress, um, if you're a web design student, please do this. Okay? It's something you're going to use from this point forward or beginning in CS224. Um, Backtrack Linux, again, a great tool for system and network administrators. And again, if you prove your work, you know, in a semester or two, um, I will release a copy of Backtrack version 4 to you. Um, again, if, if someone is out there searching for it, I could not find it any longer. If you find it on the web and it's still available, let me know. I'd be very interested. Can you look at them? What's that? Can you look at them? Um, I'll try if I have time. Okay? Um, yeah. There, there's some right now. What's that? I do. Um, by the way, if you're doing Backtrack Linux, by the way, um, there's some USB installs down there lower. Backtrack Linux is a great USB install. Okay, I didn't require this. I would love to, but um, not everyone can boot from a USB, and you can't do that, of course, on campus. So I left that out. Um, again, the uh, the word is on Backtrack Linux. Please use it for good. Okay, please don't just you know start hacking for the sake of it. Um, so uh, I told I told the story. Uh, in the, it's kind of it's similar to that. Um, I used to teach skiing at Gore, and uh, I raced and all that stuff. Uh, and we ran the junior development program with me and a, a friend of mine. And J JD junior development is like seven and eight year olds who a lot of these kids can ski the expert trails. And um, first time we did this without knowing, we just went to the top of Gore, and they all their little helmets on and stuff. And kids have a very different perception of space than adults. They will cut you off within a foot of you. So at the top of Hawkeye, we just said, you know, go. 15 kids. And so little, you know, if you ever seen the commercial, the little scrubbing bubbles, you know, just, just like terrors going down. And so we go down after them, and literally people are in the woods, down all over the place, just cursing these kids. Because um, we just kind of unleash them on the mountain. And we learned, okay, send one or two off at a time. So similarly with Backtrack Linux, um, you know, I'm, I'm asking you to do this. I fear sometimes, you know, just sending an entire 150 CS100 students out there with Backtrack Linux on thumb drives, you know, um, and what kind of damage this could spawn. So um, again, please, please use it responsibly. <laughs> um, extreme programming with Java with Eclipse. Eclipse is a great visual development environment, and by the way, have you, have you thought about using it in Program Logic 1 yeah, or 2? Yeah, yeah. It is, for, for step debugging, tracing, package management, it is, it is unbelievable. There are other options. There's NetBeans, things like that. We, we uh, chose Eclipse because New York State agencies use it. GE uses it. So it's kind of the de facto standard in this area. Um, note that it's not just for Java. There are PHP plugins, XML, um, drag and drop interface options, JavaScript. C, C++, pretty much everything for Eclipse. So for the whole program lifecycle management, and it really does support agile and extreme programming, and I'll talk about that in just a few minutes, or actually, hopefully tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> there's a shell scripting um, final project, and that's pretty much straightforward. And that you can do on the campus's computers. Okay? So here's an option if you don't have your own computer. By the way, you can do the Eclipse. Um, Final project on the yep. you, sh you should. Um, 
if you go to a four-year school, okay, um, you know, you go to Albany, you go to RPI, whatever, in your systems analysis class, analysis class, your operating systems, you will write operating systems, things like this. For that type of code management and tracking, because you have versions too, it's a, it's a version system, you can actually go back to versions that are working. This has happened to all of us. You know, I had it closer about two weeks ago, and just blown away what you've done. So the ability to backtrack and, and just pick up where you left off from two weeks ago is great. USB utilities, and there are a few here. Um, <clears throat> great utility. You know, God forbid your system crashes. Okay? You can boot into a USB drive, bypass and you don't need your operating system, of course. The ability to retrieve files, you know, you have a term paper due, your system crashes. I don't know why the timing, but it does. Systems crash at finals time. Um, so the ability to go in and pull off your, you know, term paper, pull off a friend's term paper, you know, they owe you. They owe you big time. Um, so you can cash in on that. Um, having also, um, and USBs, by the way, if you really want it useful, it should be persistent, so it carries your data. Great usage, you know, you go on spring break, you're down in Florida or something, and there are, you know, computers in the hotel lobby, kiosks, things like that. Last thing you want to do is jump on there and start browsing. Okay? Now, whether you can boot from the USB is another matter, but um, you can run applications from a USB drive. So you're leaving breadcrumbs on your USB drive that you pull out and take with you, rather than on that machine. Okay. So again, even if you don't choose this for your final project, I recommend you grab one. Okay. And I do too. I, I do a PC USB. Oh, lost the menu. Um, I do a PC USB um, and a, come on, get over there. I almost ran out of mouse cord light there. Um, because you can run persistent programs and then also a, a, a Ubuntu. Um, if you really want to, you can write a term paper. Okay. That should be your last option. Um, so in that course conclusion lecture module, of course, is the final project submission, um, a final project discussion board. Okay, so you have to document, tell about your experiences. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm looking for. Yeah, I mean, what can you say? If it, if, right, if everything went just straight. I guess if you could tell me, especially because you did the eclipse, um, are you going to use it in the future? Um, how valuable was it? You know, what do you see? Um, yeah. So, so in that case, quite often, um, you know. With Ubuntu, the lamp installation, quite often things go wrong, um, especially if you don't follow the instructions or you haven't been doing your Linux homework. Um, same thing with Backtrack. Um, so documentation is going to vary. I just, I just want to know. Um, one thing, it gives me perspective into how to modify it for future semesters. Um, if I see a problem arising over and over, I'll go back in and change my notes, try to get people over that home. Question? I'm sorry. Um, if you do the USB drive, mm -hmm. I'm assuming you can't turn that in online? No, you have to drop it off to my office, and then I'll, I'll have it back be in my office. So, and, it, and it has to go to my office. Someone wanted to just finish it last class and wanted to give it to me. I'll put it in my pocket, I'll go home, and it'll go in the wash. Or it'll go into a black lab's tub. So it has to be dropped off to my office, and it will not leave my office until you come pick it up. Where's your office? Uh, brand 206. Um, so final project, final project. Project discussion board. There is a Linux quiz. The final Linux quiz is there, and then also the ethics discussion board. The ethics discussion board, and I do provide information on that. Oh, get this mouse scrolls in one direction, opposite by everything. Okay, so it's right here: ethics and professional conduct. Um, <clears throat> and again, I don't make any judgments. It's not you know, you could state this is your ethical opinion on anything. Okay. And that's not, I'm grading on just the application, you know, um, stockholder theory, stakeholder theory, social contract, okay? Just the ability to assess it from a perspective. Um, and it does require a reference. Um, so, and that's just an APA online reference. And I'm not a real stickler. By the way, note, you should notice um, <clears throat> for your other classes. At least with APA, I've never assessed Microsoft Word's MLA. Microsoft's APA citation feature has bugs in it. Okay? So if you get a professor who's just a stickler on references, and this will happen. You go to grad school, dissertations, theses, things like that. You know, 
missing comma, just anything wrong is going to be just, they're going to hammer you. Um, know that Microsoft Word does make errors, okay? It's not Microsoft Word's, Microsoft's version of the APA, so just know that. Uh, any further questions on final projects, sir? What, what, what final project? Oh, the USB. Yep, utility drive. The bootable utility drive. Actually, the hardest thing may be just getting the U3, the, the bootable system, off of that USB. So, what's that? We won't even go there. There's, there's an ethics discussion waiting to happen. Mm -hmm. I tell you, the, the best way to get that U3 off a USB drive, find some over the Mac. <laughs> it'll, it'll rip it off in a second. I'm assuming the Linux, last quiz is on all the Linux lab we've done. Yes, it's comprehensive. So, and again, um, just just go over them. It's better if you, you know, even even get in and play, you know, actually enter the commands because there's something about using them that cements them in memory. Okay. Um, so here we go, programming languages, chapter 13. OK. Let's recall our foundation. Computing processing is input processing output. That's what a computer does at the CPU level. That's what you do you know, in Program Logic 1, CS 110. Okay, you write programs, input processing output. It even scales up to information systems, input processing output. It's just the complexity that varies over these, these three dimensions. <laughs> Pardon me. Okay. Um, why do we need to know program languages? We're going to look at this in a minute, but it's our ability to express and code ideas. And think about this. How well can a three-year-old or a five-year-old express themselves? Can they express abstract ideas? No, they don't have the ability. They don't have the communication skills yet. That's the same path that we're trying to develop here. Okay? The ability to express ourselves and code all different things for the computer, communicate with and through the computer. Okay, now, first, let's take a look at something. Um, have you had truth tables in programming logic one? Okay, not yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> truth tables are used um, in computational science to determine, of course, and, and demonstrate or, or illuminate truth values, okay? I'm just going to present three very basic ones here, not and and or. What's that? Yeah. Um, so you, if you transfer to a four-year computer science program, you will definitely have a machine architecture class. So you will see these again. Computer information systems, maybe, maybe not. It depends on the program, okay? Um, so here is the not gate. One input, one output, okay? Note the nomenclature, okay? The bar, the line over the A means not A. So A is input. It's inverted or complemented and becomes not A. Here's the truth table. So again, we're dealing with Boolean values, true and false. So of course, the complement of true is false. The complement of false is true. You invert true, becomes false. You invert false, becomes true. So this truth table, of course, is very basic. To create a truth table, what we do is we enumerate all the variables. And here, there's just A. okay? And we enumerate all the possible truth values for it. So A can be 0. In this case, I'll use 0 to represent false. 1 will be true. So A, if A is false, not A is true. If A is true, not A is false. Okay, simple. Okay, the AND gate. Okay, the AND gate conjunction. Okay, is represented with the multiplication symbol. Here we see the truth table for it. Two inputs, one output. I have A. I enumerate the variables and the output, and I enumerate all possible values. Sorry, it splits across two screens here. So, what are all my possible values? Well, A can be false. When A is false, B can be either true or false. And if A is true, B can be either true or false. So I have four possible truth combinations here, permutations. So look at this. I'm sorry for this. This is corny, but you'll never forget. 
this like me for it, but you'll never forget. I use, you know, A and B, apples and oranges. Okay? Do you have apples and oranges? You have apples, false. Okay? You have oranges, false. So the result, apples and oranges, is false. Apples and oranges, apples is false, oranges is, fa is true, but do you have apples and oranges? Well, you have no apples. So apples and oranges, A and B, is false. Okay? So false and true is false. Same thing, true and false is false. The only time that the result is true is when both operands okay, are true. Now take a look at this. In computing, in computer science, we always strive to be efficient. right? If we can ever save computing cycles, we do so. Which means, or what I'm, what I'm tr trying to get at is, is there ever a case where I can determine the truth value of the result, the composition, through just evaluating the first operand? So I, is there ever a case where I don't need to evaluate the second operand? Take a look at this. Yeah, if, uh, if, there, if there is one in the first one, because that automatically tells you. Right. If the first one is false with the and, the result is always going to be false. You have apples and oranges? I don't have apples. I don't care if you have oranges. Okay. Does anybody know what this is called? Well, the, the whole thing's a truth table. Short circuit evaluation. Can we ever use this to our adva advantage? Well, think about it. Okay. Compilers will create optimal code. They'll do optimization. Okay. But a compiler doesn't understand your business. Okay. If I am coding and I have two conditions, and I'm going to add them together, it may be likely that one condition almost always happens or, or almost never happens. Okay? I have two conditions, A and B. If I know A only happens 5% of the time, which means it's false 95%, I'm going to put it first in the expression. right? Because then the system, as soon as it gets a false, it doesn't have to evaluate the rest of the expression, short circuit evaluation. And that second part of the expression could be huge. Maybe the second part of the expression is, is retrieving something from the internet and comparing a value. I've just taken out in 95% of the cases that internet access. Okay? So again, anytime I can improve efficiency, I do so. Take a look at the OR gate. Okay. Note the, the OR is represented with, and again, note the, the symbol. And I'm not, I don't require anyone to recall the symbol at this point. Um, the OR is represented with the plus sign, okay? A or B. Again, I can do the apples and oranges thing. Sorry, guys. Um, do you have apples or oranges? Okay. So false or false is false. False or true is true. True or false is true. And, of course, true or true is true. Now, there is a case, you see it down below, um, exclusive OR that would actually remove that. Exclusive OR means one or the other, not both. Okay. Is there something here that I can use in term for short, short circuit evaluation to where I can evaluate the first operand so that I don't have to ex op evaluate the second one? Right. The first one is one, right? Because true or anything, it doesn't matter, is true. So again, the same logic applies. If I know my business process, and I, I'm going to do, I'm going to or two things together, and each one is a different condition, if I know one of them is going to almost always be true, I evaluate that first, right? So I don't need to evaluate that second condition. Because it's, it's simple here, I'm just going A or B. But recall, this B, that could be a method call, okay? A database lookup across the internet, okay? Because of composition. Okay, everyone get out a piece of paper, please. I would like you to evaluate the truth value of this expression. Okay? If not, B is less than A, and C is greater than D, or D equals A. Please don't tell me what it is. Okay. Look at the parentheses. Okay? <laughs> it's pretty funny. Scramble for pen and paper in a computer science classroom. 
<laughs> Again, please do not tell me the answer. And this is something, of course, you should be doing <laughs> in programming logic more. Okay? And the first rule, no matter how simple, never do it in your head. Never, ever. <laughs> Don't tell me. Don't do it. Um, because it's all about the process. Okay? If you follow the process, you will not make errors. Okay? If you vary your process, you will make errors. It's interesting. Um, Professor Hurd told me once. He did this, this research um, on computer science and who had the ability to learn it. And they took groups of students and they gave them problems. And of course, if the students, different types of problems, but if they always got the right answer, of course, yeah, that mathematical thinking, they're good for computer science. Interestingly, they found that if someone always got the wrong answer, they could teach them computer science because they were following a process that allowed them to always get the same answer. The people who couldn't learn computer science were those who would get the right answer sometimes and the wrong answer because they're not following the process. You know, in, computing, in computer science, we talk about determinism, and I'm going to bring that up in a minute, to where we always need to be able to choose one of two paths. Okay? Always. Deterministic. So it's not amb amb ambiguous. Okay, so what do we do? The process. First thing, write down your memory location, fill in the values. I made this easy, okay? I could have started putting, you know, pre-increments and, you know, post-increments in here and actually use, you know, A, if I pre-incremented it here, we get evaluated once, increment, and be a different value down here. I didn't do that, okay? That's coming in programming logic. Okay. So write down your memory location. Force yourself to do this. So what do I do? How do I answer that? Or not? First thing you should do, make it easy, okay? Uh, link up your parentheses. Now I can see what's going on. Okay. Okay. Right. B is less than A. True or false? False. Okay. Six is wow. less than seven. <laughs> Six true. is less than seven. True, true or false? Okay. True and, can I do anything with short sense of evaluation? No, what's the case <laughs> with and, but I can stop. Evaluation. The first one's false, so I have to keep going. Okay. And C is greater than D. 13 greater than 4? Yeah. Do I need to evaluate this? Nope. No, short circuit. So I know true or anything is true. Okay. True and true? True. True, true is true? Or not true? And false. Pretty clear, straightforward. It's all about the process. If you follow this, so what is that process again? I wrote down the memory locations. Force yourself, even in the simplest program trace. False. False. In the simplest program trace, force yourself to write down the memory locations and track them. Every time you make a change, change them. If you come to a conditional, link up the parentheses, evaluate them, because that's what we have to do to test the semantics of a program, of course, is to do hand tracing. Now, of course, if you have Eclipse, you can just kind of turn that debug feature step trace on and evaluate things as you go. So download and get into Eclipse there. OK, so back to program languages. OK, <clears throat> now I presented um, way back week two, week three. Um, we looked at architecture from a generational perspective, first generation, second generation, third generation. And I mentioned, even though the textbook doesn't present it this way, 
we had generations of operating systems. Okay? And they kind of corresponded to the generations of architecture. Well, the textbook actually does present that we have generations of programming languages. Think about what an operating system is. Okay? Programming, right? So it makes sense to have corresponding generational advances in, in architecture, programming languages, and operating systems. Okay? We went from you know, standalone, single programmed machines to batch programming, then to multitasking, things of this nature. So we have the same kind of evolution in programming languages. Machine language, native language of the architecture. Computer architecture, of course, is that instruction set. Does anybody recall two different types of instruction sets? I'll give you one. There's a risk reduced instruction set. The other is complex. So there's risk and CISC. Okay? Risk instruction sets, risk, risk, risk architectures, have a small predefined set of instructions that typically occur just or take just a few clock cycles. Why are they efficient? Well, think about Tetris. Think about if you were playing Tetris and all you had was just tiny, uniform, small squares. Simple, right? Because that's what we're talking about, processing step. We're talking about multiplex. Okay? With complex instruction sets, I have instructions that may take 13 clock cycles, 17 clock cycles, you know, three clock cycles. And now think about a pipelined architecture, okay? I now have sit, I now have Tetris with these crazy blocks. Okay, I'm going to leave gaps. I'm going to lose instruction cycles somewhere along the way. Complex instruction set architectures can are, are can be very good um, for many things, especially graphics, things of this nature. Okay, that just you can detail and program a specific uh, instruction to do to do something more efficiently. Okay. Machine language had its drawbacks. Um, it's efficient. But from a programmer standpoint, it's very hard to use. Zeros and ones. So if I want to add two numbers, I had to go to a table and look up what is that opcode, machine opcode instruction for add. Okay? And then I have to encode it. Zero, one, one, zero, and I'm just making this up. One, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, whatever. You know, is it 16 bit word, 32 bit word, whatever? Actually, way back then. Could have been an eight bit um, You can see that I'm going to make a lot of errors, okay? Because I'm doing a table lookup from some table to get the opcodes and record them. I am programming in binary. Okay. Thank thankfully we don't have to do that anymore. Now, the next evolution, assembly language. Because now you saw this in the, the example we did with the fetch execution cycle. I now have mnemonics. So rather than looking up whatever the opcode is for add. I have add, add R1, R2, add 1, R1, R2, and store it in the accumulator. Or sub for subtract, or MUL for multiply, did. Okay? So it was a lot more user friendly. But the key thing to think, remember here, assembly language still was a one to one correspondence. For every machine instruction, there was an assembly language instruction. Yeah, if done well. Yes. Yes. And if you're writing device drivers, things like that, if you are hacking, Okay. Yeah. Everybody, everybody looks up. I'm gonna do that. Um, assembly language. You know, you get into buffer overflows. Um, yes. Yeah. So, assembly language. Know that it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the assembly language and the machine language. Now, what did that require? Because now I'm writing symbolically. I translate that. So now I have source code and object code. I need to assemble it to convert it into executable code. Okay, so I did add a step, but still, the advantages far outweigh the, 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 any negatives. Okay, now, higher level languages. And this is what we're writing in today. C, Java, whatever. Um, but we do need to, again, it's, it's much more expressive, okay? X gets Y plus Z, okay? Rather than move you know, Y into a register, move Z into a register, add the two components, get them from the accumulator, write them back to memory, okay? Now, of course, in a high-level language, I have symbolic, okay, or symbols, so to speak. Um, I still need to either compile or interpret this, okay? And this, ha this is a new, new concept. Some people may know. Can anyone tell me what is the difference between compilation 
an interpretation. Interpretation is done on the fly by Um, like, for example, in Linux, you have bash. Personify. Um, I'll go to the compile code. Good job. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. Um, for, first correct answer in two, maybe three semesters. Great. OK. Yeah. Compilation, static, before execution, before runtime. Interpretation, at runtime, dynamic. Compilation static, and I kind of presented static and dynamic way back when, but we're going to see it come up over and over. Are there benefits? Okay. I'll, I'll take it from you. I know you can answer. Um, compilation. I'm doing it once. If I'm writing the Microsoft Windows operating system, okay, I write it in a high-level language, and I compile it. I turn it into executable code. And then I can distribute this executable code on CDs or whatever. I performed that translation once. If it was interpreted, I would distribute the source code. And then every time you wanted to run it, you would, your individual machine would have to perform that translation. So you can see this. Compilation, if I'm distributing a, a million copies, I compile it once. If I distribute the source code, well, you are yourselves, or it's being translated one million times. And note, <clears throat> If you call a procedure five times, you're reinterpreting five times. So think about loops, procedure calls, and all of these things. Does interpretation provide any benefits? Why would anyone ever use it if it's more expensive from a computational standpoint? What's the difference between ActiveX and Java? Is one more secure than the other? OK, Java. We compile Java into bytecodes, but at that point, it's actually interpreted. It also runs in the sandbox and a few other things. Some, some <coughs> are also a little bit looser. Yeah. I, I took some liberties there, so forgive me there. Interpreted, OK, compiled code. You are distributing zeros and ones. If you really want to know what that program is doing, you have to reverse engineer it. You have to decompile it. Right? Recall that fetch execute cycle. CPUs just grabbing stuff. Do this, do this, do this. It doesn't realize, you know, reposition, read right head. Start writing zeros. Write some more zeros. It doesn't realize that you're erasing a hard drive. Interpretation, you're getting the source code. Your system can act on it in intuitive ways. Erase hard drive? No. Stop. Okay? Interpreted code can, because it's dynamic, you can do things on the fly. It can be adaptive in terms of Exception handling, error codes, things of this nature. So compilation, static, interpretation, dynamic. Okay. Interpretation is more expensive, but it has some benefits in terms of being more adaptive, flexible, and more secure if it's done properly. OK. Um, why do we study programming languages? You're wondering why I put this stuff up here. It's important. Everyone here is going to be a systems analyst to some extent. You're going to have to make choices, OK? Just even in the design phase, what programming language are we going to use? Okay. Are you developing something that is going to be used in your organization for the next 20 years? Could happen, OK? Well, if I want some continuity, I might want to go Java. There are other programs that are more efficient, okay? Get straight to the point, great. Ruby on Rails, things like that. But those programmers are in higher demand. They're harder to find. We need to say that um, good Java programs are just in just as high demand. Um, so you get someone, Ruby on Rails, and they develop, and then they leave your company. Okay? Now you have this application standing here. Okay, I need a Ruby on Rails program, right? And you have to go out and find one. Or maybe you take someone in-house and tell them to come up to speed. So for a couple weeks while they're coming up to speed and learning it, you know they're not really doing any effective work. <clears throat> then they learn Ruby on Rails. They become highly valuable, and they leave your company. There's your, there's your cycle. Okay? You need to be able to assess this from a systems analyst standpoint as well. Um, just as important, the study of programming languages, your ability to remain relevant will require that, that you learn new languages over time. Okay? An easy way is to learn Eclipse. And, you know, with plugins and stuff, it kind of helps you along the way. 
Um, but everyone here will, will do programming in many different languages over the course of your career. The quicker you can come up to speed, you go for an interview. Oh, we're working in this. Well, I've never worked in that, but I've done these other projects in 10 programming languages. I came up to speed in one day. You're hired. Okay. <coughs> okay. Programming paradigms. There are four programming paradigms. The book doesn't really present it like this. Again, paradigm just means model. Okay, so there are four programming models. Um, procedural, structural, imperative, kind of the same word for the same thing. They're, they're small differences, but I won't get into it right now. <clears throat> Action-oriented in that you develop an algorithm. Okay? You have a problem. You develop an algorithm to, to solve it. This is decomposition, too. Okay? You have a problem, and while Java, we're learning Java, which is object-oriented, when you write your methods, what are you doing? You're, you're taking a logical function right, and creating a method for it. Maybe I want to print. Maybe I want to do some processing. So I'm grouping things and creating a method, okay? logical decomposition, because it creates reusable components. I don't have to write the code over and over. And really, you want to devolve it or decompose it into its smallest piece. Okay? You want these small interchangeable pieces. This is net beans, the net beans approach. Okay? Because if I create this, all these little small pieces, I can mix and match and reuse them as I see fit. Object-oriented, I'm going to come back to this in just a second. Um, logical and functional. I think next Tuesday, um, rather than start database management systems, because that's, that's an entire course, two semester sequence, and we do it in a chapter in this, this level. Um, I'm going to defer that till after Thanksgiving. So I think on next Tuesday, I will do the, the prologue, the artificial intelligence um, demonstration. Um, so again, functional and, and logical really are in the domain of mathematical programming, but also um, artificial intelligence. You look at what's going on with drones, what's going on with robotics, you know, Google cars, all these things. So this is the future. You can do AI programming in other languages, but these are the two um, best for doing this. Now, no. We're on the von Neumann architecture, stored program, memory, CPU, things like this. Von Neumann, you know, these, these logical and functional languages are mapped to the von Neumann architecture, but, but they're not ideal for it. They're not optimal. Von Neumann architecture is optimal for, say, a procedural language and the procedural components of object-oriented. <clears throat> okay, back to object-oriented. <clears throat> Pardon me, who's my voice again? Object-oriented, there are three basic principles or foundations to it. Inheritance, encapsulation, and polymorphism. We'll cover encapsulation first, because the, yeah, the second two are kind of uh, related. <clears throat> encapsulation, of course, is means enclosing. Think about what you write when you write a Java program. You're writing a class, of course, and creating objects. What is an object? It's an encapsulated attributes and behaviors. And everything is an object. Okay? I can, I'm an object. Okay? I have attributes, blue eyes, brown hair. Now I'm describing the state. I'm a, the state of my object. But it's also the state of an object is where it is in its computation, where it's in its execution. An object also has behaviors. It'll have behaviors that it can act on itself or also interact with the outside world. Encapsulation is security. Okay. I don't know if this has been driven home in Program Logic One. Quite often, it's it's not. Um, all attributes, variables, should be private. Very rarely will you have an attribute of variable. If you want to interact with the variables, the attributes, you write a method, and the method is public. This way, you're constraining access to the variable in the ways that you want it to be. Okay? My attributes, blue eyes, brown hair, you can't change that. Okay? I guess I could. You know? okay. Right, but I could do it. You know? Okay, you can call me down, whatever. But let's not go there. <laughs> um, so you, you get my point. Think about it from a bank account. A bank account, bank account has an attribute, balance. Right? What if that balance was public? Of course, you know if an object, if an attribute is public, you can access it, object.attribute name. I could change it. 
if that if that balance is public, I'm going right in. No, actually I'm not, but key bank, you know, balance gets balance plus a million. They don't allow us to do that because they define the business logic. What is it to deposit? And it's a predefined process for this. You hand over money, you deposit check, whatever, they count it, they verify it, and they increment your balance. There's no way to access the private attribute from outside. Now, there's buffer overflows and things like that we're not going to get into. But in all honesty, all attributes are private. You provide public methods. Again, net beans. You've probably heard that buzzword. I'm just kind of giving you an introduction to it. Inheritance and polymorphism. Inheritance allows us to move from the general to the specific. An inverted tree. Up at the top is the most general. Of course, the super parent, the parent of all in, in Java, is the object. Okay? Um, as I go down, I can provide more specificity, okay? more specifics, so I can extend. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay? I can use a previous class and extend it. And I'm actually going to do, I'm going to give an example here, wake everyone up again, with, with game design. All game design, all game programming now is essentially done with object-oriented programming. Okay. While I'm on that, let's recall what we know and start really putting together what we've learned. Two types of graphics. Bitmapped graphics and vector. What did I say? What are vectors? Object-oriented. Okay. So when we now see it's all starting to come together. Now lastly, polymorphism. Poly means many, more needs forms. I don't know if you've seen this yet, but <clears throat> you can call different objects at different levels in the hierarchy. And of course, if that method is defined at that level, it uses that method. But if it's not defined, it uses the method in the parent class, inheritance. So I don't always need to redefine things. But let me, let me look at something else, too. How do we call a method in Java? Okay. Well, well, within a, within an object, you can just use the method name, right? What if I want to call a method in another object? Well, no, but there's. It's hard to ask a question and not, you know, and, and no, in there, you don't know what I'm looking for. Object dot method name. Seen that? Okay. Object dot method name. <clears throat> That's how to call a method in another object. What data type is that object? When you create a new instance, when you create a new object, new, no, it's actually a, a pointer, a reference, an address. Okay? Okay. Well, it is. Now you know. Um, and it's okay. You just haven't gotten there yet. But think about our world today. What do we live in? A networked world. Implicit in the Java model, calling a method. Object dot method name, objects and address. It doesn't matter if that address is local on my machine here, or that address also includes an IP address. Okay? There's, there's an elegance here. Because now, let me give you a game design example. I have a game, object oriented. And I decide I want to make more money. So I'm going to create the next version of the game. Okay. So I create a new player. I create a new, use the example of monster, because I have no imaginations. Um, I create a new monster, and it inherits from its previous attributes and behaviors, but now it can breathe fire. So I write a new method to breathe fire, you know, destroy players, maybe other monsters, whatever, furniture. Um, so now, each one of the players, again, an object is responsible for its own behavior. So each player will have, say, a move function, okay? Player one dot move, open close friends, okay? Which would be very different from, say, a car's move function, because the car is in charge of that, and it can go, you know, 30, 50, 100 miles an hour, whatever, okay? A monster may move twice as fast as a player or once as slow. Again, each object is responsible for itself. I can get every player to move on a screen by putting, remember, it's object.method name, object is an address. If I put those addresses into an array, and I put that in an array in a loop, and I know you haven't really seen array. Have you seen arrays yet? 
Okay, just just started them. Okay, so for each index, so array name index dot move open close parenthesis for one to whatever for every player and monster on the field they all move. I now have a new monster. I just add their single address to that array, and the new monster is added and moving with the game. I've written 200 lines of code to add fire breathing to whatever to a monster. I've done minimal programming. I have a new game version that I can actually market and sell for more money. Everybody has to have that base version. Now, there are other things, you know, improvements in graphics and things like that. But again, what are the graphics? Object oriented. Okay? So now you can see what's going on. And this will tie right into when we get to Agile and, Agile and Extreme Programming, adaptive programming. So this, this, is, this is one of the reasons. So object oriented, inheritance, encapsulation, polymorphism. And I know you haven't had it presented at this point, but now when you go back, start looking at Java from that perspective. Okay, programming domains I'm not going to really get into. Scientific, business, they, of course we started with scientific, you know, calculating missile trajectories, business, COBOL, things like that. Big one is relational database. Um, I do want to cover one more thing here today. Um, well, actually two more things. Note, note that scripting languages course, which is one final project. Scripting languages are typically interpreted. Okay? Um, language evaluation, the one thing I wanted to cover here um, is operator overload. Using the same operator for different types of functions. Function. Does Java allow operator overloading? Can you, how can you use the plus sign? What, what, what data types? You can use it with math, of course. You can use it in other places. Okay. Strings, concatenation, okay. overloaded operator. Now, you can also overload methods or functions. So you can have methods with the same name. How do you distinguish? Because computer science, computing must be deterministic. You must be able to distinguish between one or two paths of execution. Okay. Determinism. No ambiguity. You do this in with, with function or method overloading through method signatures. You need to be able to distinguish. So if you have two methods by the same name, they must differ in the number, type, and order of their parameters. So you can have an add function that takes two ints, or you could have an add function that takes three ints. So if you call the add function or method with three arguments, note I did use arguments versus parameter, Talk about that. Hopefully, you know the difference already. It knows which one to choose. Okay, method or function overloading. Okay, I'll stop here. Please read through these because I didn't cover a lot of these, and you should just be aware of them. And then I'll pick it up tomorrow. Thanks.